for our conversation on Cuba. Um, I first want to recognize and thank uh, Lillian Cruz from Senator Van Hollen's office. Thank you for coming. And Martha Sanchez from Congressman Jamie Raskin's office. Um, thank you for coming today. And so today what we're going to do, I'm going to say a few words to welcome us. I'm then going to turn it over to our county council member, Mark Elridge, and then we will hear from the first secretary, Miguel Fraga, about Cuba. Um, we are also hoping that um, our congressman, Jamie Raskin, will be stopping by later today as well. So that's a treat for us. Um, after our, um, the remarks, we'll open it up for q and I know we're a small group, but since we are recording, we do ask that you use the microphones um, so we pick it up on the tape uh, for later. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and I also just want to th say thank you to Rienberto Rodriguez, the um, director of the Silver Spring Regional Center, uh, for bringing us together. Um, I think we, the three of us had, an, or the four of us had an opportunity to meet at uh, the Cuban Embassy in the fall and start talking about the importance of building relationships and getting to know people and, and really thinking about how we can do that best. So we actually first planned this for um, this fall for um, in December, um, but had to postpone it with the passing of Fidel Castro. Uh, and I think the doing it now, given um, our new administration, other changes that have happened, um, is a great opportunity. It brings new meaning to um, building friendships, having conversations, uh, and moving forward. And so we're glad to be here today. Um, you know, there's a lot, and I know probably this crew knows um, what has happened with our U.S.-Cuban relations over the last eight years, but it is really remarkable to think about the change that has happened um, under President Obama, um, and even just as he was just leaving office, um, the policy he put in place. Uh, so, you know, there's a great deal that has happened in the last eight years, and I'm excited to hear from um, the First Secretary about what is going on in Cuba, what the Cuban people are thinking, and how we can build these uh, relationships. Um, but before we hear from um, the, uh, the first secretary, we're going to turn it over to our county council member, Mark Elridge, and thank him again for coming. This is two days we've gotten him in the community center, so <laughs> we want to thank him very much uh, for being here. Probably everybody knows Mark has served um, on our county council, and he was also for many years, I think you had 10 terms on the city council here in Tacoma Park? Yeah, 10 terms, uh, 19 years sitting on our city council here in Tacoma Park. Um, and we know Mark must be really patient because he's also a fifth grade teacher. So, <laughs> so with all of that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. Well, this, this is a really interesting topic, I think, for Americans, um, and probably for Cubans in, in some way, but it's, you know, it's more a problem for us than it is for them. Uh, I, I've long been interested in, in American relations with Cuba because I grew up with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so my, I had two introductions to Cuba. One was Castro coming over in the 50s when I was really a little kid. I was probably 10 years old and seeing him at Yankee Stadium and on the pictures of that and you know the kind of discussions and then things go very south and I'm probably 10 or 12 years old and things start going south and then comes along the Cuban Missile Crisis and it made me as a kid worry about um, what was this all about and there were a couple of things that struck me. One was I didn't want to die and I understood the threat of having missiles 90 miles from the American shore. But I was then introduced to the notion that America had planted missiles less than 90 miles from the Russian border in Turkey, and that we were part of a global chess game. And the Russians were making the point that we don't feel very comfortable with, with missiles on our border either. And perhaps everybody should think about this. And we know the ultimate resolution of it was that the missiles got pulled back from both countries and off of both borders. And I viewed that as a good thing, not particularly the way <laughs> I would like to have gotten to a resolution of the problem, going to bed every night and wondering whether you were gonna wake up. It was not my idea of fun. But uh, I thought the resolution was a reasonable resolution. 
Uh, I was intrigued by the revolution that was made in Cuba. I thought that the, uh, uh, what I knew of the, about the dictatorship and what I was later to learn about American relations uh, with Cuba was really disturbing. I, I wind up in college and I'm doing a paper on um, the United States and Cuba after the Spanish-American War. And as a student in all the proper American history books, you get this quote from McKinley about we, how we have to save these people from the brutal Spanish government. And we were doing them a favor. So in, in my paper, I just, I was looking at this relationship and I'm starting reading the State Department files and the letters exchanged between the US State Department and the Spanish government. Not the Cuban government primarily, but the Spanish government. And when you read the State Department papers, what you read is, if you do not crush the rebellion, we will come in and crush the rebellion. We are not going to have another black slave republic on America's border like Haiti. Um, so constant exhortation of the Spanish to actually increase their brutality and destroy the legitimate aspirations of the Cuban people to be free and liberated from Spain, not unlike America getting liberated from the British. And when you read this, you realize, well, I was fed a load of bunk. And when I found McKinley's letter, it's like one paragraph in a five-page letter or so complaining about damage to American business interests in Cuba and in other places. And then you read a line about bringing Christianity to the savages, and you realize he's talking about Christianity to, to Catholic countries, both here and in the Philippines. And that tells you it's another window on America's mentality that we were intensely at that point, even anti-Catholic. And the Catholicism was viewed as not Christian, um, something which I'm glad I didn't have a part of that discussion. But those are the kind of things you kind of dig up when you're reading history. And the part that disturbed me more than anything else, if you go to the archives and you check out um, documents, you have to sign for them. So I saw the signatures of many of what are considered great American historians who read the same documents that I had. They read John Hay's letters to the Spanish government. They read McKinley's full speech. They had all this stuff. And the stuff they picked out was the stuff that suited their interests. The stuff about crushing rebels, killing these people, destroying the revolution. All that other stuff is left out of the history books. And it was kind of like a, a cold awakening. Um, because it's one thing when you know something intellectually, it's another thing when you read it, when you realize you picked up the same materials and somebody decided to use something, um, what they picked out of it, and they managed to leave a whole bunch of stuff on the cutting floor. Um, so I've, I've always been interested in this topic, and I've, and I've always believed that people who trade together and talk to each other are less likely to fight, because when you start developing mutual relationships and mutual interests, you have much more at stake and many more reasons not to fight than you do to fight. And I was struck by, uh, again, going back to Cuba's period in, in South, South Africa, when they were fighting and supporting the Angolan government, was that the Trilateral Commission, which as you all know was a creature of the Bushes and other major American interests, were trading with the Angolan government despite the call for sanctions against the Angolan government because their cooperation with Cuba against South Africa because we were supporting South Africa. Nobody in this audience should be confused about where America was and the issue of apartheid. We supported it. We contributed to it. And so I'm, I'm looking at this stuff on Angola, and it was just really striking. And it was striking that business people and, and the Bushes were talking about the value of trade and the idea that they didn't want to be at war with Angola. That they thought by trading with them and bringing them into the world market and the world network that we would be better off than we would if we tried to extend the war in South Africa into Angola. And so I've always taken the view that, that trade and cooperation are actually important things. And, and the truth is, trade and cooperation changes everybody. Because once you start talking to each other and once you, know, you even start traveling to, to see each other, your perceptions begin to change. And I never expected anybody to come out of this untouched. There are always things I thought you know, could have been done you know, differently in Cuba, but you know, I sure as hell thought things could have been done differently in the United States. It's not like there was the perfect model versus uh, everything else. And I would say, you know, anybody heard Trump's comments about Putin, which are you know big subject of this afternoon's talk shows, 
It's like, yeah, there are a lot of killers. And we happen to be among them. You know, a little bit of truth. I mean, every once in a while that man says something which is true. But, you know, we had, don't have an unblemished foreign policy. We don't have an unblemished domestic policy. It's not like opponents of the American government have never been killed before. Go ask Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers. Go ask Labor and Civil Rights Panthers. So there's, there's plenty of imperfection to go around. But what I do know is that war is the worst path you can go on. You should never do this unless there's absolutely no choice. Hitler, there was absolutely no choice. But there are a ton of other wars we've been involved in. We probably had other choices, and other choices might have been different. So I've always looked and felt that we ought to be treating Cuba differently than we have. I've been there a number of times. Uh, I went uh, in the early 80s. First, I went to the anniversary of the um, Samosas overthrow. I was there for the first anniversary of the revolution. Um, I s stood in the Revolutionary Plaza. I heard uh, Castro challenge the American ambassador to a competition in Nicaragua for who can send the most doctors and teachers, to which the American ambassador had absolutely no constructive response. And I thought that was kind of telling. I mean, Castro is saying, here's a country that's been devastated by war. And by devastated, 50,000 dead Nicaraguans out of a population of 2.5 million. That's one out of every 50 people killed in that country, primarily men. And when I was there, and I'm, I'm sitting in a small village neighborhood, and I ask where the men are, and I'm just told dead. Dead. Pictures of them on all the walls, but where are the men? Dead. Little kids and grandfathers, yes. But people my age, people who would have been conscripts in the army, gone. Um, so I was, you know, I was pretty moved by that. And I, was, and I was impressed by the willingness to kind of try to engage the United States in a constructive dialogue and try to say, let's, let's rebuild this together. Let's see what we can do. And I feel like, you know, it was a missed opportunity. It would have been a great thing had we chosen the path of, you know, working beside somebody else and putting aside political differences and saying, what do we do to make this? A, a different outcome in Nicaragua. And I, I thought that, I was glad at least somebody raised the possibility of doing things differently. Um, I traveled after that to Cuba, and I've been back, I guess I've been there four or five times now, and I've gone from different places. Uh, I was, uh, the first couple of times was completely legal. Um, the other time is maybe not so much. Um, I always felt that, uh, I never felt comfortable with the idea that the American government could constrain where I traveled. And I never felt comfortable with the assertion that Cuba represented a terrorist power because that's not something Cuba did. In fact, back in the old days, revolutionary movements didn't really engage in terror. They fought wars, they attacked soldiers, they did, they did what you'd expect somebody to do if they were in a war. Um, Terrorism, I think, is a later phenomenon. and It's more appropriately used for some of the stuff that happens today where civilian populations are genuinely terrorized. But I don't think it was an appropriate uh, use of the word as far as Cuba was concerned. And the fact that they supported Angola against the United States and against South Africa is not an act of terrorism. Most of us would call that an act of liberation. Um, and I was really happy to see at least one country in the world that knew what was the right side in South Africa. And it sure wasn't the United States. Um, so I would say that you know, my, my travels to Cuba were always interesting. I was warned the first time that I went down there that I would, uh, that somebody would monitor everything I did in every place I went. And what I found was I got up in the morning, I walked out of the hotel, I went wherever I wanted to go, I went by myself. I never got approached by anybody. I talked to people in the street, I never had police come up and say, you can't have this conversation. I walked into an eyeglass factory and talked with workers in, in, in the factory there. And I found that you know, for the time I was there, I had totally normal time, like I would have had pretty much in any other country. Um, the most striking thing was the first night when I was thinking about walking around. And you know, we all come with precon preconceptions of things. And if you look at Cuba, it's pretty beat up. It's not the the neighborhoods look, if you were in the United States, you say that looks like a rough neighborhood. And I asked somebody, I said, so is there any place I shouldn't go? 
And the response I got from, I guess he was the guy at the hotel, kind of reception or concierge, whatever. And he said to me, he said, we don't do things like that anymore. I thought that was kind of an interesting response. I mean, there was sort of a sense in talking to people, the people who committed crimes and, you know, particularly violence against people, that that was not, that was not acceptable in that society. And I would say that they have a somewhat different view, I think, than Americans were outlaws and bad guys. Just kind of, we have a romanticism for outlaws and bad guys. You know, the bank robbers of the 30s were sometimes folk heroes to people. But in the Cuban society, people who robbed and stole were not folk heroes to anybody. Because if you stole something, you were stealing from the people. And that's not a very heroic thing. And I, and I was kind of struck by that difference. And every time I've gone back there, I've had the same relationship. I've never been guided. I've never been steered. I've never been interfered with in a conversation. I've never been told I can't go here, I can't go there. And it's so different. And I had no particular importance. The first time I went down there, I was a student in the University of Maryland. I had no reason to say, well, I better not you know, mess with him because he's, you know, he's in the American government and he might say bad things about us. I, I was just like a regular person. And I've always felt like a regular person when I went there. And I've talked to dissonance. It's not like they don't exist. And I've had people offer you know, better exchange rates on the money. And I wouldn't do it, and they couldn't understand <laughs> why I wouldn't take more, more than I could get from the government. I said, well, because there's a reason why your government has this policy, is that I'm not interested in your money. And they thought that was strikingly un-American. But <laughs> I was like, no, this, I, I get what's going on here, and I'm not, I'm not here to disrupt it. And so I'd say that you know, my experience has always been positive. Um, I've seen warts and I've seen things that, you know, that make me uncomfortable. But at the same time, I've seen things that I thought were very hopeful, and I hope that Cuba continues to evolve. I hope that we resume evolution in the United States um, and we reverse the devolving that we seem to be going through right now, and we actually figure out our way back. Um, but I think that uh, I hope that things continue to progress. And you know, my politics are pretty left. And, and I've never been comfortable with single party systems. And I've always thought that it doesn't mean you have to have two parties that are controlled by corporations. Um, but you ought to have, there ought to be more room for dialogue. But I did meet people who were active in Cuban politics that weren't party members. And that was kind of intriguing because I'd assumed that everybody had to be a party member to be involved. And there were some people I met who weren't. Um, but I think that you know, if you're going to have a socialist country, that you know, at some point you really have to expand democracy and control the workers. Um, I was encouraged by the movement to cooperatives, which I thought beat state farms any day. When you talk to people who work in cooperatives, they'd explain to you very clearly why that was a better deal than a state farm. And I'm not talking about the insurance company. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, they, and you know, th that, uh, the cooperatives have elements of capitalism in terms of incentive and rewards for production that don't exist on state farms. And I thought that encouraged people to be more productive and more inventive. And, I, and it seemed to me an evolution that I hope is a continuing evolution in Cuba, because I think those things are important. I never understood the lack of a credit system there. I mean. That's you know, the backbone of the growth of the American economy. Uh, we get to buy things based on future income. And that was not something that, that was available to people down there. And I thought that you know, if you're going to expand your economy, you need to look at some things outside your box. And I'll close by saying I had a dinner with the Cuban attache a number of years ago and a, and a couple of other people. And we were talking about what, you would, what would you do differently. And I was struck by the sense that people felt, and I've said this myself a number of times, you know, we seem to be caught between an 18th century idea of capitalism and a 19th century idea of Marxism. And we're sitting here in the 21st century as if there's nothing to be learned, no possible understanding that might have occurred post Adam Smith and post Marx that would lead us to say, is there a different way to do things? Do I, and the Cuban attache and these, there's representative, I guess, from Bolivia and from Venezuela there. And everybody was kind of like, why do we have to confine ourselves to this box? Why do I have to align myself this way or that way? 
How about we try to figure out what, what actually works and let ideologies and ideas flow from what works rather than trying to force everything into a box or squeeze everything out of a box. And that was probably the most hopeful conversation I had because I do think that all of us need to think about how we continue to evolve, uh, not to defend the status quo, but to look at how we go forward. And I think that Cuba will play a role in that. Um, I think perhaps in some years in the future, America will resume playing a role in that. But I think it's really important a really important thing to happen. But I would say that you know, my experiences in Cuba and all those times were, were generally positive and made me hopeful for the, the future of the revolution and the possibility of change. So I'll leave it at that and we can talk more later. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark, a lot to think about, and we'll have a chance to do questions and answers in a few moments. But first, I would like to bring up uh, Miguel Fraga. He is the first secretary at the Embassy of the Republic of Cuba in Washington, DC, since we reestablished diplomatic relations in 2015. He was appointed the first secretary in June 2015 uh, to, to the then Cuban interest section. Since 2006, he has worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in both North America and the US divisions in the office of the minister. From 2008 and 2011, he served at the Cuban Embassy in Canada. We hope you stay here now. <laughs> and from 2003 and 2008, Mr. Fraga was a member of the People's Power Provincial Assembly of the City Havana, which is the provincial parliament in Havana. So thank you for being here today, and I will turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mayor, Council Member, uh, from the office of the Senator, and all the people that is here. Uh, don't worry about the Super Bowl. We're going to be on time. I was worried. I was worried, to be honest. Uh, but thank you so much for this. And I, will, I want also to say thank you to Roberto. Roberto is another proof that you can love both countries. You know, he loved Cuba, he also loved the United States. And when he comes and says, are you ready to do this in Tacoma? I say, yes, this is what we need, you know, to talk. We need to, to know more. We need to learn from each other, you know. I'm sorry for my English, but all I, I need to improve, but this is a good opportunity to practice. And at the end, yes, all the questions that you want, I, I, I will do my best. People think that uh, as diplomat, you are expert in everything and people want to know about everything. So if, if I don't have the answer, I, I will get back to you uh, with uh, the information that, that you need. I, I have been able to travel here in the United States since I came, and this is a, pre a presentation that I try to, to change all the times to put new information about my country, about the relations between Cuba and United States. And so far, I have been able to, to do this presentation in 21 American universities. Um, is a great opportunity to, for the interchange. So let's start. You can see here uh, on your left, you can see Washington Memorial here in DC. But in your right, you can, have, you can see Jose Marti Memorial in Havana City. You can see how similar they are. And you can see that we have the same colors in our flats. And this is because we have a lot of history together. We share a lot of history together. We cannot change that. We cannot change the idea that we are neighbors, you know? And as somebody mentioned before, if you go to Cuba right now, despite all these 50 years, despite all these problems that we had in the past, you're going to see that Cubans don't hate Americans. You're, you're going to see that Cuba is a friendly country that, and, and the majority of Cuban, I really believe, that wants better relations with the United States. So let's, let's start. I have some opening questions. The first is, what do you know about Cuba? And I think this is very important. Every time I do this question, I, ha I, I have different answers, you know? People say, people say, okay, Cuba is famous because cigars. Cuba is famous because rum. Some people say, okay, Fidel. Uh, but I remember one student here in American University in DC, and when I did this question, what do you know about Cuba? He say, I know about Cuba. And he say, what do you know? And he say, well, I know I love Lucy, the, <laughs> the TV series back from the 50s. And I say, wow, Cuba is not Ricky Ricardo. And by the way, you missed the last 50 years. But the idea is that, yes, in the majority of the American 
people, what they remember is the invasion of Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But what about these last 50 years? What, what is happening in Cuba right now? What, what, what is the real Cuba? What do you know about the real Cuba? So for, for, I really believe that there is a lot of misinformation about my country. Every time that you go to the media, what you read is that Cuba is the worst country in the world. Uh, and you don't have the information that I'm going to present, probably. So would you like to visit Cuba? You can raise your hand if you want. OK, OK, you see? That is a good support. Thank you so much. Number three, do you consider that Cuba and the United States can have normal relations? The real, thank you. The real question is, why not? Why Cuba and the United States cannot have normal relations? Oh, because we are communists? You have wonderful relations with countries that are communists. Because we only have one political party? You have wonderful relations with countries that don't allow political parties. Is this about human rights? I don't think so. If you go to the situation that we have in Cuba and you compare with another countries, even with the situation here in the United States, you're going to see that human rights is not the real issue. And I really believe that diplomacy engagement is the correct path to solve all our difference. So number four, has you been in Cuba? You can raise your hand, please. How many? OK, this is interesting. but. In the universities, it's not the same. And here, here uh, the idea is that when the majority of people say, yes, I want, I want to go to Cuba, but the majority of people has not been able to travel to Cuba. And as you probably know, Cuba is the only country that you need a license to go. As Americans, you can go wherever you want. But in order to go to Cuba, you need a license. Why? We are the big threat. The, we are the worst country in the world. And for the, this is for the end. Do you consider that Cuba received fair treatment in the media? Well, if at the end of this presentation you already knew, because you've read it on the media, every, all the information I'm going to present, you can say, yes, Cuba received fair, fair treatment in the media. Let's see. I'm going to start with this quote. Why the Cuban revolution? Why the Cubans made a revolution in 1959? Well, this is a quote. I believe that there is no country in the world including any and all the countries under colonial domination where economic colonization, humiliation, and exploitation were worse than in Cuba, in part owing to my country's policy during the Batista regime. Batista was the former president, the former dictator of Cuba. I approved the proclamation with Fidel Castro made in the Sierra Maestra when he, he justified a call for justice and especially yearned to right Cuba of corruption. I will even go further. To some extent, it is although Batista was the incarnation of a number of sins on the part of the United States. Now we shall have to pay for those sins. In the matter of the Batista regime, I in agreement with the first Cuban revolutionaries. That is perfectly clear. Do you know who said that? OK, that's, you see, you don't read that in the media. That is October 24, 1963, and it's President Kennedy. And I always like to say, the same person that approved Bay of Pigs, the same person that deals with the missile crisis, and I really believe that we avoid a nuclear disaster sent to Bay of Pigs. And some people say that at this time, in October 24, 1963, President Kennedy was trying to improve the relation with, with Cuba. Probably you remember that President Eisenhower cut the diplomatic relations on January 3, so 17 days before President Kennedy took office. And he approved, again, Bay of Peak. That was a huge disaster. And we have the, the missile crisis that we avoid the nuclear disaster. So I really believe that this was his real opinion at this point. Unfortunately, he was killed one month after this. By, by the way, uh, when you want to know, and when he mentioned Cuba, corruption in Cuba, I always say, if you want to know what was Cuba before 1959, you need to see The Godfather's second part. Have you seen that movie? The moment that the mafia is in Havana trying to create a new Las Vegas, that was true. If you want to see the golden phone, you need to go to the Revolution Palace, the museum of the revolution. You can see the golden phone there. And of course, it was not the Corleone family, but was another family from the mafia train trying to create a new Las Vegas in Cuba. So let's start. What is Cuba? Well, we are 11 million of people. The big threat is smaller than Pennsylvania State. Our GDP is 77 billion of dollars, and the majority of the numbers I'm going to show today come from the World Bank. So uh, you can check the numbers in the World Bank website. 
But if you don't believe me, go to Cuba. Uh, our GDP is number 67 out of 195 countries. Our labor force is 5 million of Cubans, and right now, 10% of that labor force is in the private sector or in the cooperative sector. And that is a huge change. That, that is something that in the last 10 years, we have this number, 10% of the labor force in the private sector. And this is because the majority of people support that. So it was not a decision in order to have relation with the United States. It was not a decision in order to change because we need to change. No, it was a decision because the majority of people support this idea. Uh, our per capita income is uh, $6,000, uh, and I put 2013 because it's the last number that the World Bank has. This is also Q. Our life expectancy is 79 years old. Our birth attended by skilled health staff is 100%. The mortality rate is four ch uh, children per 1,000 life birth. Immunization, 99% of our children receive all the vaccine for free. The 1% that don't receive vaccine is because religious reason they don't want, and we respect that. Physicians, we have 6.7 doctors per 1,000 people. According to the World Health, uh, Health Organization, the 44% 40, 40, of the members of state report less than one doctor. And we have 6.7 doctors per 1,000 people. For that reason, we have doctors in so many countries in the world right now. Literacy, we have 100% of our population. But look at this. According to the United Nations, 700 million of people right now don't know how to read and write. 95% uh, has access to improved water sources, and 93% has access to improved sanitation facilities. And let me say this because I really believe, I don't come here to say that we are perfect. I don't come here to say, uh, to say that we are better than you. I come here to say this is also Cuba. This is a Cuba that you probably don't know because every time it's about democracy, human rights, Cuba is the worst country in the world. No, no, no. We can work together, and we can find a way to do things and to improve the life of both countries. And we really believe that this is what the majority of the American people wants. is also what the majority of the Cuban people wants. And every time that you talk about Cuba, remember our GDP. Because it's not fair to compare Cuba with the G7 countries. But even if you compare Cuba with these numbers, you're going to see that we are not so bad. <laughs> also, according to the World Bank, Cuba spent 12.8% of our GDP in education. And in 2010, that was the highest investment in education worldwide. Cuba spent 8% of our GDP on health. Uh, and this number is from our sources. To health and education is allocated 51% of total expenditure of 2017 budget activity. So we know what are our priorities in, in Cuba. Our military expenditure is only 3.5% of our GDP. And according to the World Bank, we are considered uh, an upper middle income country. According to the United Nations, Cuba is number 67 out of 188 countries in the Human Development Index 2015. And we are in the, in the countries that are considered high, that have high human development. Sports, I love sports, but you know how expensive sports are. Uh, before the revolution, we only had like nine Olympic medals. Right now, we have 220, 77 gold medals. And we are very proud of that. Uh, baseball, baseball. Uh, I have some expert here that has been in Cuba, has been visiting Cuba. We had 199 players born in Cuba that has played in Major League Baseball. The first was in the 19th century, Esteban Bayang, 1871. So Cuban players in Mayo League is not, in nothing new, you know? Last year, in opening day, Cuba was number three with 18 players born uh, outside the, the US. I had the opportunity to visit Cooperstown. And in Cooperstown, with the three new members that you're going to have this summer, you have 350 members of the Hall of Fame. Only 10 are Latinos, but four are Cubans. You know that? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. But look at this. 
Cuba is the only country that their, their players have to defend in order to play in Major League Baseball. So if a Cuban player comes to United States, needs to sign a, a letter and say, I'm not going back to Cuba, I'm not going to bring back money to Cuba. And look at this number. Since 2010, big league team had signed at least 25 Cuban players to Major League contracts worth at least one million for a grand total of 645 millions of dollars. Not a dime goes to Cuba. And for example, you have right now uh, this uh, bill in Congress, in the 115th Congress, that is HR 573, that only asks for the opportunity of Cuban players to come here, play, and go back to Cuba. Yes, you have wonderful Cuban players, but you can have more if we are able to work uh, together. More information about Cuba. I love Twitter. You know, I love Twitter because it's a challenge. You, have to, you need to put all your ideas in 140 characters. So I find a lot of information on Twitter. And this is from NASA, the historian account. And look at this. Happy birthday. This was last year in January. Happy birthday to Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez of Cuba, first Latin American and first person of African ancestry in space. Was a Cuban. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, Cuba is the first country in the world to receive validation for eliminating moral to child transmission of HIV and syphilis. According to WWF, Cuba is the only country in the world today that meets the criteria for, su for sustainable development. And according to UNICEF, Cuba has eliminated severe child mal malnutrition. I believe it's the only country in Latin America that can say that. Internet. Uh, I put this slide because some people say, why do you not have internet in Cuba? You don't want internet in Cuba. No, yes, we want internet in Cuba. And yes, internet is, is expensive and it's slow, but it's not Cuban fault, you know? And right now we have internet in all the country. We have 1,006 1, internet public access point, and we have 200 Wi-Fi zones in Cuba. Yes, again, it's expensive, it's not, a, it's not fast, it's a slow, but we are open to internet and we have internet in the universities for free for the students. And according to our numbers, a quarter of a million of Cubans use internet daily in points Wi-Fi. By the way, they, they do what the American people do, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Uh, they want to know what is happening in the world, so they don't do any research or something like that. Uh, but the real problem is this. More than half of the human people don't have internet in the world. So the problem is not Cuba. And before President Obama, Cuba was not able to connect to the cables that surround the island. So it was very expensive for Cuba to connect to, to internet. And I put this because this is the journalist from CNN in Havana. Uh, in October, he put this tweet. Huh trying to wash a Susan Rice webcast on loosening of Cuba restrictions but getting a prohibit prohibited location error message. So even when President Obama is trying to uh, open the internet for Cuba, he still have this problem in Havana. And I replied to him in my Twitter account, I put this, this proof at least three things. The embargo is still in place. There is internet in Cuba and it's limited by the same embargo. He don't say nothing to me, by the way. But my ambassador also replied to him. And he said, yes, yes, ambassador, you, are, you have the reason. Because he put this, and you don't know who to blame for this. And the problem is that the embargo uh, is the main problem for us to connect to, to, to internet. Our key trading partners, well, exports, you can see Venezuela, Canada, Netherlands, and China. Imports, you can see Venezuela, China, Spain, and Brazil. So when people come to us and say, how is to do business with Cuba? How can I do business with Cuba? I always reply, as to the Canadians, because we are doing business with all the countries in the world. Of course, the embargo is the main obstacle for us, but we have relations not only with you know, left government, we have relations with almost every country in, in, in the world. Cuba is not isolated anymore after the Cuban Revolution. Only Canada and Mexico keeps the diplomatic relation with Cuba. Right now, we have diplomatic relations with 191 countries, orders, and institutions, 190 of the 193 United Nations member states. 
We have 114 foreign diplomatic missions in Cuba, and we have 122 Cuban embassies and missions abroad. If you compare that with some countries, you're going to see that that is a huge number. Of course, a, a Cuban embassy sometimes is a house with a Cuban flat and two people inside working hard. <laughs> Don't worry, we have more than two people here in, in the United States, not only two. But in any case, that proves that Cuba is almost everywhere. But not only diplomacy, we believe in cooperation with the world. And so far, more than 300 South and Cubans collaborators have provided service in 158 countries so far. Right now, we have more than 50,000 Cuban healthcare workers providing service in 65 nations. And half are doctors. We have doctors in 65 nations. So when you read in the media that we send doctors to Venezuela because the oil, I say, well, why we have doctors in Africa or why we have doctors in Haiti? And we have 400 doctors in Haiti for the last 10 years. And we send 400 doctors to Africa to, uh, to fight against the Ebola epidemic. And for, by the way, for the first time, we work together with the United States. The United States provide the facilities, provide the resources, and we provide the doctors, and we succeed, we stop the, the epidemic. Thanks to the Yes I Can educational program, almost 10, 10 million of people have left illiteracy behind in 30 different countries. More than 68 Southern students from 157 countries have graduated in Cuba in the last 50 years. And we have this school, this is the Latin American School for Medicine that we create in Havana to help Latin America, but after that, many countries came and say, okay, I want to have a students there, and we open the opportunity for the students to, to, to go, and so far we have students from 117 countries, and more than 25 Southern medical graduated from 84 countries. By the way, we have, I believe right now, we have more than 100 students from the US, from the US, and the only thing that we ask to the students, because is they are they are there for free, is after you you graduated, you need to go back to your community, and be a doctor there. So it, we are talking about people that don't have enough resources, and they come from communities that is probably not uh, easy to go to the school of medicine, and we provide that in order that they can go back, and that also helps Cuba because it's very expensive to have doctors in all those countries, by the way. Well, I put this because for the first time I read it in the US media, two years ago or three years ago in 2014, this was an editorial from the New York Times, and they say Cuba, Cuba's its impressive role on Ebola. And they say Cuba has a long tradition of dispatching doctors and nurses to disaster areas abroad. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the Cuban government created a quick reaction medical corps and offered to send doctors to New Orleans. The United States didn't take Havana up on that offer. We offered to the United States 1,000 doctors. And at that time, people say, okay, this is politics. This is not about friendship. After that, uh, unfortunately, we had the earthquake in Pakistan. Pakistan asked for help, and we sent the doctors to Pakistan. At, the, at that time, we didn't have diplomatic relations with Pakistan. So, and we did the same on September the 11, 2001. We offer our airports, we offer our air, air space. Uh, and I put this because this is a quote in my Twitter account last year, uh, two years ago when you commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Katrina, because this was what former president of Cuba, Fidel Castro, said in 2005 during this moment, and he said, there is nothing strange about the behavior of Cuba, which does not hesitate to offer the people of the United States the immediate dispatch of experienced doctors with the essential resources needed to administer emergency care to people in mortal danger following a serious natural disaster. So, but what happened between Cuba and the United States? Everything changed December the 17th, you know? Both presidents, breaking news, both President, President Raul and President Obama announced to the world that they are ready to start a, a new path in order to reestablish diplomatic relations. This is our national newspaper, Grandma. Um, you can see that we published both speeches 
President Raul and President uh, Barack Obama, uh, the speech in, in Spanish for all the people. I tried to find the same here in the United States. So far, I was not able to find one single newspaper that published the speech of our President Raul Castro. And by the way, this is the New York Times uh, front page, and you can see that there is Fidel Castro, not even Raul Castro, uh, but you know, well, why this happened? Why this happened on December the 17th? I have been told that here in the United States, you love polls. You always want to see what people say about something, you know? So if you see, if you look to all the polls before December the 17th and after December the 17th, American polls, you're going to see that the majority of the Americans wants better relation with Cuba, and also the majority of the Cuban Americans. I'm going to bring your attention to June 2014, so before December. This is the second one that I, I show here. Is from the, uh, let me see, oh yes. This is from the Florida International University. Why Florida is so import important? We have two million of Cuban Americans living here in the United States. We have Cubans everywhere. In all the 50 states, according to your census, we have 348 in Alaska. I don't know why, why <laughs> I don't know what, 348 Cubans are doing in Alaska, but anyway. Uh, but according to to, uh, to United States numbers, 1.2 million live in Florida, and the majority are in uh, Miami-Dade County. So when we talk about Miami-Dade County, we are talking about the majority of the Cuban-American community here. And you can see that in June 2014, Florida International University said that 68% of Cuban Americans in Miami-Dade County support normalizing relations with Cuba. 71 expressed the view that the embargo was not working at all or not very well. And you can see polls every time that we have a major moment. So when we reestablish diplomatic relations, when we open our embassy, when you open your embassy, and in all the cases, you have the majority in favor. And by the way, this is the only poll that shows uh, what happened in Cuba. And according to this, 96% of the Cubans think the embargo should be eliminated. It's the only one that I have from American sources that show what the Cubans want. So we start negotiations between Cuba and the United States. The good news is we have women in charge. You know, that is important. Uh, yes. <laughs> and after that, this is the first meeting between a, a, a minister of foreign affairs of Cuba and a U.S. secretary of state. Don't, don't, don't look at the faces because this was at midnight and this was in, in, in Panama during the summit of the Americans. But after that, we have the first meeting between President Raul and President uh, Obama. And, and I always say, you know, you know what? We are still here. Nothing bad happened. The world don't come to an end after, after that. And we reopen our embassy in D.C. and you reopen your embassy in Havana. And after that, we have another meeting between President Raul and President Obama in uh, United Nations. Uh, and everything was, was okay. Another important moment in the relations. In May 29, 2015, the uh, United States removed Cuba for, uh, from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. That was a very important moment because since the 80s, Cuba was in that list. And that was an excuse that was used many times to say, okay, we cannot have a relation with one state that is a sponsor of terrorism. But I always say, you are not going to find any single evidence that we commit any crime or any act of terrorism here in the United States. You're not going to find that in, in any place. And we know how important is terrorism for, for the United States. We, I have been able to visit New York every time I have the opportunity to see the, the Pentagon. And also I was able to visit the, the place for the Flight 93. And again, I, I can understand the pain and, and the angry and the fear that you, you, you went with the terrorism. But you know what? We commemorate September 11 before you. This was a Cuban diplomat on September 11, 1980, here in the United States that was shot and killed in New York. And that day is the day that we uh, pay tribute to the fallen in the foreign service in Cuba. And again, it's 1980. And we know what is to use planes. Plane, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. And we know what is to use planes, uh, again, uh, in order to commit terrorist actions 
because in 1976, uh, people uh, put a bomb in a civil plane and killed 73 people. The majority of them were, were Cubans because the plane was a Cuban plane. So we know what that means. And again, there is not a single evidence that we commit any terrorist action against the United States. Oh, the reasons to put Cuba there was because Cuba was supporting the liberation movement in many places, because we have soldiers in, in Africa. Again, you need, you need to read what Nelson Mandela said about that. And for many years, Nelson Mandela was considered a terrorist uh, here in the United States, unfortunately. And about the liberation movement, many of them are now in power in, 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 those in, in the countries. But let me show you this, because I find this, and this is a secret memorandum from the CIA uh, that prove that at least one country commit a terrorist action against the United States here in the United States and was the government of former dictator Pinochet. And I don't know if you are aware that this former dictator Pinochet ordered to put a bomb in a car here in Washington, D.C. and they kill the foreign minister of, for, of Salvador Allende, but also kill a U.S. citizen. And you can see here in the last sentence that Secretary of State Schultz wrote to President Reagan, nevertheless, this is a blatant example of a chief of state direct involvement in an act of state terrorism, one that is particularly disturbing, both because it's occurred in our capital and since his government is generally considered to be friendly. So uh, I, ne I don't remember uh, Chile was in the state of a sponsor of terrorism, list. And I don't remember that Chile, uh, that the United States put an embargo against Chile. And if you want to talk about dictatorship, you need to ask to the people of Chile what was Pinochet, what was Somoza uh, to the people of Nicaragua, what was Batista uh, to the people of, of Cuba. So again, this, uh, when, you, when you mentioned before about the documents that you can read and they are able, and you don't see this, and you say that Cuba is a terrorist na nation because we sent soldiers to Africa. My father was four years fighting in Angola, but I am proud of that because now Angola is a free and independent country, you know, and, and South Africa and many other countries in, in and we didn't took nothing from, back from, from those countries, by the way. So another important moment, you recognize the, the place, that is the Oval Office and you recognize for, former President Obama. The other person is my ambassador, and he's the first Cuban ambassador to, that present credential to a US president since 1959. The last one was in 1959, okay? And by the way, that is our embassy in DC. This beautiful place is 100 years old. According to the DC authorities, it's the oldest building as an embassy uh, right now in DC because the ones that opened before changed the location to Massachusetts Avenue, and we are still in 16th Street. And this was the person behind that, the construction of that building that was the minister plenipotentiary to the United States between 1913 and 1922. And this was the first person that hold the title of ambassador here in the United States between 1923 and 1925. And sorry, more polls, but I have to show you that it's not only two or three. This is, you see, from the Atlantic Council, that is a think tank here in the United States, and they made a poll in Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and Tennessee. I don't have the numbers from Maryland, but probably we can do something here. And you can see that in these polls, 70% of the people believe that the United States in the, is in the wrong track, but 68% support the ties with Cuba, you see? And this other poll is from Gallup, and according to Gallup, for the first time since 1996, the majority of the Americans have a good opinion about Cuba. And again, this is so important because when you ask to the people that made this poll, the majority of the American people has not been able to travel to Cuba. And the majority of the American people only read bad news about Cuba. And you have 54% that support or, or have a good opinion about my country. Imagine if the Americans be, has been able or are going to be able to travel to Cuba. We are going to have better, better numbers for, for sure. In the last two years, we have five members of the cabinet in Cuba, the Secretary of State, Commerce, uh, Agriculture, Transportation, and, all, and also Health. Uh, we have, in the last year, 10 members of the Senate and 43 members of the House. And we have, in the last two years, eight governors. 
New York, Arkansas, Texas, Virginia, uh, Missouri, Louisiana, Virginia, and also uh, uh, West Virginia, sorry, and also Colorado. The governor of Colorado is right now in, in, in Cuba. Uh, and you can see from both parties, uh, not only Democrats, Republicans also, and you can read what they say after they visit Cuba. The majority say, okay, we have opportunities there. We, we, we see a friendly people. We, we can do more. Um, that's important, you know. We are talking about everything. We are talking about environment, law enforcement, and counter narcotic. We are talking about mail, because for the first time we signed an agreement to send mail between Cuba and the United States. You know, in the era of the email, <laughs> we have for the first time in more than 50 years the opportunity to send a letter to, to Cuba or to uh, bring a letter from, from, from Cuba. Claims. Many people believe that the real problem between Cuba and the United States is about the property that Cuba took from the U.S. companies. But you know what? It was not only to the United States. We also took uh, properties from Canada, Great Britain, <laughs> France, Spain, and Switzerland. And by the way, we signed agreements. <laughs> we signed agreements to solve all that problems. And the last one was in 1980. I was one year old, by the way. Uh, and that was with Canada. But we signed agreements with France, Spain, and Switzerland in 1967. So the problem is not because we don't want to solve the problem. The problem is we didn't have the opportunity to sit down and talk. We are talking about human rights. We are talking about global health. We are talking about travel. We are talking about commerce. We are talking about internet and telecommunications, security at, uh, of trade and travel flow. And of course, about the Colombia Peak Stalks. I, I don't know if you, if you are were, were aware that Cuba was the host of the negotiation from the peace in Colombia, because the only place where the FARC were, were, was able to, to feel secure to talk about the peace with the Colombian government was in Cuba. So we signed an agreement uh, for that in, in Cuba. We, we have right now a commission, a bilateral commission for negotiation or normalization. Since the reestablishment, we have signed 22 agreements between Cuba and United States, official agreements between Cuba and United States about many of these issues, and we are still talking about another. Uh, we have 19 high-level visits, 13 from the US and six from Cuba, 42 technical meetings and cooperation activities. But let me say this. We establish diplomatic relations, but we don't have normal relations. Why we need, what we need in order to have normal relations? This is my ambassador last year during the National Day celebration, and he said, in Cuba, we believe that bilateral relations with the United States will be normal only when we exercise full sovereignty on all our territory, when we are no longer under the sanction regime, and when no specific programs are funded to alter our way of life. I'm going to explain this. The embargo. Everybody talk about, about the embargo. But when you ask, what, what is the embargo? People don't know. People don't, don't know how to explain what the embargo is. So I bring this document, and you can find this document was secret between 1960 and 1991. Right now, you can find it here in the Foreign Relation of the United States, 1959, 1960, Volume 6, Cuba. It's very easy. You can go to the internet, and you can read the document, but it was secret. And look at this document. They say, point number one, the majority of Cubans support Castro. This is 1960, so before we said we are socialists. And they, they find that the majority support Castro, and the lowest estimate I have seen is 50%. I don't know you, but 50% is half of the people. There is not effective political opposition. So a country with 50% of support and not enemies. And what they say, well, I'm going, I'm going to put to the last two sentences. They say that they need to deny money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wage to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of the government. <coughs> so a government that at least has 50% of support, a country that you don't find uh, opposition and you want to create hunger, desperation, and overthrow of the government, unfortunately, that was the official policy toward Cuba. And for that reason, it was very difficult to have relations between both countries. Right now, the embargo, what we call blockade, is not a bilateral issue anymore. This is from the United Nations. For the last 25 years, Cuba present a resolution. And for the last 25 years, the United Nations General Assembly asked to the United States to lift the embargo. 
even your allies, you know, not only our friends, no, 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 your allies vote with Cuba. But the last year, in 2016, we have 191 votes in favor. You can see here, everybody's in green. And only two countries in extension, United States and uh, Israel, were the only two countries that vote in extension, but not against. So you can say right now, no country in the world support the embargo. How much cost the embargo to Cuba? Well, in the last year, 4.6 billion of dollars. What that means? That means that we have spent 4.6 billion because the embargo. We have to pay more for some products. We have to bring products from the other part of the world. And people know that we are not able to buy here in the United States, and they ask for more. So that means that, for example, in health, the embargo cost to Cuba $82 million of dollars in one year. Education, $1 million. And culture and sport, $29 million. And for those who say, no, but now you have relations. Yes, since December the 17th, the US government has fined 11 entities, seven Americans and four foreigners, for uh, this amount of dollars. And you know where you can find this information? In the Department of Treasury here in the United States, in the Office of Foreign Asset Control. So it's not Cuban uh, propaganda. This was President Obama last year in his last speech of the Union. 50 years of isolating Cuba has failed to promote democracy and set us back in Latin America. That's why we restored diplomatic relations. Applause. This is not what you have to do. This is what happened in the, <laughs> <laughs> this, this happened in the House, you know? Opening the door to travel and commerce, positioning ourselves to improve the life of the Cuban people, applause. So if you want to consolidate our leadership and credibility in the hemisphere, recognize that the Cold War is over. Lift the embargo, applause. So let, let's do this for a moment. The majority of the Americans don't want the embargo. The majority of the Cuban Americans don't want the embargo. No country in the world support the embargo. Your president is asking to lift the embargo. Why the embargo is still in place? Every time that you hear somebody, OK, who do you represent? That is something to think, you know? Uh, the other issue, Guantanamo. I know that Guantanamo is very famous because the prison. Because the prison. But it's not only the prison. It's a base. And you can see this is Cuba. And here is Guantanamo. And you can see that the base is in the middle of the bay. So we don't have access to the bay because you are here in the middle. And you have been there since 1903, more than a century ago. The land belongs to Cuba, but the original agreement based on the Platt Amendment gives the United States complete jurisdiction and control over the base. Yes, you have to go back to the Spanish-American War. The war was not in Spain, was not in the United States, was in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Philippines, uh, uh, but it's not called that way, it's called American-Spanish War. But in any case, after that war, you occupy Cuba with your army. And during that occupation, we wrote our first constitution. And the people that was the US governor in the island called the people that was writing the constitution and say, if you don't approve the Platt Amendment as part, as part of your constitution, we are not going to leave. So you're not going to have a republic. And for that reason, we approve the Platt Amendment as part of the Constitution. The Platt Amendment is only seven articles. But one of them say United States can come here wherever they believe is necessary to come and can occupy the island. And by the way, you did it between 1906 and 1909. So that is part of our difficult history. That was the senator behind that bill, Senator Bill Platt from Connecticut. But another agreement in 1934 gave the United States the use of Guantanamo in perpetuity. So it's forever, unless the US either unilaterally abandoned the base or both the US and Cuba agreed to in end the lease. And you know how much is the territory that you occupy in Cuba? Two times the territory of Manhattan. You know how much do you pay? $4,085 per year. And this is not about money. Somebody told me in New York, you know what? That is one, probably one apartment costs one month in, in Manhattan. <laughs> but that is what you pay. And we don't collect the check because this is not about money. It's about our territory. And we want that territory 
back. Another issue, according to the Congressional Research Service, between 96 and 2014, the Congress appropriated some 264 million in funding for Cuban democracy effort. So you try to send money to Cuba, not to create hospital, not to create a school, to create democracy in, in Cuba. So that explains why some people support the embargo, because it's a way of life. It's a business for some people, but we, we can do more without the embargo. And I don't know if you are aware what is Radio Martí, TV Martí, and Martí Noticias. Do you know what is that? You create in the 80s a radio station to broadcast propaganda against Cuba. And in the 90s, you create a TV station. And now you have a website. And you use the name of our national hero. Imagine if we create, create Radio Washington to broadcast Cuban propaganda against the United States. But you know how much cost to you? This is a bill from the last Congress, Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota, according to, his, to her, that cost to you 700 million in the last 30 years. And in 2015, that cost to you 27 million. By the way, you're losing money because nobody in Cuba sees see TV, TV MRT. But in any case, I am always trying to, to finish. Uh, you know that Cubans are famous for long speeches. Don't worry, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to be brief. But the idea is that we need, we need Congress to change what is happening right now. And for example, in the last Congress, we have bills about freedom to travel to Cuba. In the Senate, we have 53 senators behind that bill. And nothing happened, unfortunately. More, more than 50%, 53%. And we have the same in the House. And we have bills about trade. And this is what happened about trade. We buy 70 to 80% of our food abroad every year. We are talking about $2 billion of dollars, according to international sources. And unfortunately, it's prohibited by law to give credits to Cuba to buy agricultural products here in the United States. For that reason, we only buy here less than $300 million, and we buy in other countries $1.8 billion of dollars. So you are losing also opportunities. We have opportunities also in the health uh, sector. We have products that we can be bring here. For example, this product uh, is right now in 26 countries, and is, is going, is, is, the, the idea is to prevent people that suffer from diabetes. Uh, if you use this product in the 70% of the cases, you don't need to amputate uh, the foot uh, because of ulcers. Um, thanks to President Obama, for the first time, we were able to bring a Cuban product that is a cancer vaccine against the lung cancer. And right now, we start the trials in the Roswell Park Institute in New York. So we make progress. And by the way, in January this year, you, uh, the University of Illinois and Chicago brings three Cuban doctors in order to try to work together to provide better health care uh, to people that don't have enough resources. So this was President Obama in Cuba, you know, the, the visit that he paid to Cuba in March last year. And I like very much what he said to the Cuban people. And you can say that the Cuban people applause President Obama during his visit to the United States. One of the polls that you made at that time say that six in 10 American things restoring diplomacy with Cuba is mostly good for the US. And the last president, the, US, the only president of the United States that visited Cuba was in 1928. Is here something, somebody from 1928? You know, President Obama say the last president needs three days to come. I only need three hours to fly to, to Cuba. We are already breaking barriers. We have the cruise to Cuba. We have the flights to Cuba. We have three hotels right now running by a U.S. company in, in Cuba. And people say, are you OK with that? And we say, well, we have 20 hotels running by a, a Spanish company. Why not three hotels from for the U.S. companies? We have agreements with all these companies and also with Google in order to improve the speed of internet in, in Cuba. We have two resolutions in the state of Alabama, in the state of California. The legislature assembly passed a resolution asking to the United States to improve the relation with Cuba. And you can see, for example, in the case of Alabama, a very Republican state. But you know what they say? We have 32 million in trade with Cuba. And we say, OK, this is with embargo. Imagine without embargo. And we have some cities. I hope to see Tacoma at some point <laughs> passing a resolution. And we have made many things. By the way, this number, 74% more 
American visitors to Cuba in 2016, 74% more in one year. And we have also Cubans. And this is sent to the relations, sent to the opportunity to work together. The last two polls, I'll, I promise, they are the last. But this is again from the Florida International University in November 2016. And you can see the change between 91 and 2016. In 91, only 14% support, support of the Cuban American support the lifting of the US embargo. Now we are talking about 63%. And if you go only to the last generation, the generation between 96 and 2016, that is 80%, 80% of support. And this is the last poll from the United States. You can see Pew Research made a poll in January, in July, and December. And you can see the numbers. And you can see for, for the relations and also for the lifting of the embargo. That this was the last thing, that, almost the last thing that President Obama did, and was the idea, for example, of allow Cuban, American and Cuban can engage in joint medical research and expand humanitarian service to improve the life of the Cuban people. And I, I say, not only the life of the Cuban people, also the life of the American people, because that bad scene that we have in New York is not for Cuba, it's for the American people. But also he put, and this is from the, the Twitter account of the White House, now there, there are not special limits on the amount of Cuban-made goods, including alcohol and cigars, that Americans can bring back with them from Cuba for personal use. I don't know why, you know, cigars and alcohol are so important that we are in, the, in that part, but you probably you know the story about President Kennedy. When President Kennedy was uh, trying to sign the, the, the embargo, he asked to his press secretary, buy all the cigars that you can. And I believe the press secretary bought, uh, bought uh, 1,200 cigars from, from, for the president, and president said, okay, now cigars are not allowed. History proved that 1,200 cigars were not enough, but in any case. <laughs> so for the end, this was the official position of Cuba before the elections. We said, after President Obama, we hope that whoever occupies the White House has a policy that reflects the consensus of the public opinion of the U.S. citizens, including the Cuban immigration in that country in favor of the improvement of relations with Cuba by the wide margin. And after the election, the Cuban president sent a message to President-elect and said, congratulations for being elected president of the United States. And this is from uh, one week ago, January 25th, uh, and this is President Raul in the summit from Latin American and Caribbean countries. And you see what he said. I wish to express Cuban willingness to continue negotiate pending bilateral issues with the United States on the basis of equality, reciprocity, and respect for the sovereignty and independence of our country. And to continue the respectful dialogue and cooperation on issues of common interest with the new government of President Donald Trump. So. Uh, I have the same question for the end. What do you know about Cuba? Probably you have now more information. Would you like to visit Cuba? I, I hope you have more reason to go there. Do you consider that Cuba and the United States can have normal relations? I really believe that now you have more reason. I cannot change number four, but probably in the future, yes. Do you consider that Cuba receives fair treatment? Well, and this is like a commercial. You don't have to pay nothing, but if you want more information about Cuba, you can follow our Twitter accounts we have in Spanish and English and also our Facebook. We are in the 21st century, we have to do this. Uh, and my ambassador, by the way, put a lot of information every day. This is the Pope. You know how important, when you talk about <laughs> trying to bring Christianity to Cuba, but you know how important was the Pope? He visited Cuba, and after that, he comes to the United States. And here in the Congress, he mentioned the golden rule. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. I think that is a wonderful idea. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. If our dreams of yesterday are today's reality, our dreams of today will be tomorrow's realities, and thus be the same for all people of the world if we are able to dream of a better future together. President Kennedy and President Fidel Castro. I always say, thank you, I always said, for those who want to cut the relations, they belong to the past, and they are going to miss the future. For those who want to build a better future, Together, we're going to start today. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry for all the time I take. Great. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, so we have a special guest. Our new congressman, Jamie Raskin, is here. So we're going to turn it over to Jamie and then do, do some Q&A. Hi, everyone.
Well, hello, everybody, and uh, happy Super Bowl Sunday uh, here in Tacoma Park uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, delighted to hear your presentation. Um, and uh, I think that everything you showed to us demonstrates the clear historical imperative, which is that uh, the peoples of the United States and of Cuba want to be able to do economic, cultural, touristic, commercial, scientific, educational exchanges on a free flow basis. Uh, and that's where everything is leading us. And that's, uh, I think, an, an historical inevitability and an imperative. And that's, that's where we're going. Uh, I think there's also a national security component to it, as you suggested, about real terrorism in the world, which uh, both countries have a lot to uh, be afraid of. And um, uh, I, I thank you for mentioning the, uh, the attack of, uh, of DINA, the Chilean intelligence on uh, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpen Moffat, which was a, a terrible atrocity uh, up until 9-11, the worst terrorist atrocity that occurred in the United States by a foreign power. Um, and uh, that was from uh, the, the Pinochet, the dictator in Chile. Uh, and of course, we did not retaliate uh, against him with an embargo, which we should have done uh, based on the, the attack and the, the killings of um, Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpen Moffat. So, um, uh, I think that uh, things are moving in the right direction. I don't know uh, what the new presidential administration has said about any of this, and obviously everybody's got their mind on other things. But let me just close with the thought that um, today, all around the world, there is a struggle for democracy and human rights and political freedom and press freedom in every society on Earth, including our own. Um, and we're not in a position to lecture anybody about political democracy with our uh, terribly antiquated and retrograde and obsolete electoral college system. Uh, and um, you know we've got a terrible problem with the uh, wall of gerrymandered districts across our country, which make it very difficult for real popular democracy to express ourselves. Uh, and I know you've got a struggle for political democracy and diversity and pluralism in Cuba, too. And you're going to have to evolve in the ways that we're going to have to evolve. And we all have to evolve in terms of real rights of freedom of expression and association and press freedom. Um, but that's not uh, a burden that falls on one society. That's a burden that falls on all of us. And at a time when we've got uh, a league of uh, dictators and despots and right-wing white nationalist movements gathering together all over the world, the people who love democracy and are championing democracy have got to stand together. So we've got to get beyond the old problems and look at the realities of, uh, of the new era. Because, um, you know, back at the home office in Moscow, uh, people are planning uh, for a right-wing coalition that includes the United States of America. And I, for one, don't want to be part of that coalition. I'd like to be part of a real democratic human rights league of independent nations and peoples that stand together for each other, evolving towards greater democracy and greater human rights. So um, thank you for your uh, hard work in bringing uh, the peoples of our hemisphere together. And I'm sorry I've got to go to another uh, commitment before the football game starts, but I promised I'd get there. Thank you guys very much. So. Terrific. So uh, now we should open it up for Q&A. Um, I, I don't know if you want to sit up here or maybe, do we have more of the microphones? I feel like sitting up there is a little <laughs> much for this crowd. Um, it's better to sit up here. I would ask if people can, if you want to um, either stand at the microphone and ask your questions of uh, Miguel um, or County Council Member Ehrlich. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Albert, Albert sorry. Did I say? I'm, I'm so sorry. It's, a, it's been a really long weekend. It's been a really long two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Well, speaking of uh, long two weeks, um, I think it's, uh, I was there, by the way, in Cuba in 2003, October. Fantastic country, love to go back, love to make it easier, but um, I was just looking here at uh, some of the things that our current president has said, um, noting that the agreement was a very weak agreement and that um, 
He thought that the Democrats were turning a blind eye to Cuba's human rights violations. So given these less than complimentary things that the current president has said about Cuba, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on where the relationship might go over the next four years. Yes, uh, also last, last week, the press secretary said that they are doing a review of all what happened in the last two years between Cuba and the United States. Our position is what I explained. I am a diplomat. I am working to improve the relations. And our position is very clear. We are not going to close the door. We can work with respect. Uh, we really believe that we prove in these two years, even with the embargo, that this is what the majority of both countries want and is also good for both people. You know, it's not only for Cuba, you know. And right now, I really believe that the, the, the embargo and that kind of foreign policy is isolated. We reestablish, or we did, a norm, and, uh, we normalized the relation with the European Union. We have business with almost every country. I remember one, uh, I, I did this presentation, something like this, in the former members of Congress Association. And one of the questions was, if we remove the embargo, what do you say to people that wants to do business in Cuba or want to engage with Cuba, but they are afraid of whatever? And I say, well, if you remove the embargo and you don't come, somebody's going to take your place in Cuba. That is for sure. Uh, we have been doing many things, even with embargo. Uh, I have one person here I want to recognize because he bring the Carrican Junior, a Carrican League, to Cuba, and they play baseball. Two days ago, I, w I, I, I went to Penn State University, and also the Penn State University baseball team was in Cuba. We have the Rolling Stone in Havana. That is the wonderful T-shirt <laughs> that proved and that was after, <laughs> after the visit of President Obama. You know, the media was like crazy. Uh, President Obama and now the Rolling Stone and Cuba was like crazy, you know. But in any case, our position is that we are not going to close the door. For many years, probably you read that, okay, Cubans don't want to put an end to the embargo. So for that reason, they always try to put excuse to don't have a relation with the United States because they need the embargo to cover all the failures in the economy. And we say, OK, United States is so good with us that they give us an excuse to use. No, no. And people say, are you ready for the end of the embargo? And I say, personally, I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, we cannot be afraid to live without the embargo. So uh, we know that this is a, a negotiation. We know that this is a dialogue between two countries. I cannot speak for your country. I cannot speak for my country and for my people. And I said that the position is clear. The door is open, and we only need two things, goodwill and respect. And we can accomplish a lot more than we did in the last two years. Thank you so much for the question. And I hope you can go to Q again. <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> um, I was wondering, what is the, is there a, youth political movement within Cuba, and is there involvement in politics for young people who wish to get involved in the government process in Cuba? In Cuba, okay. Well, uh, I consider myself a young person. I am 37 years old, not, not as, young, as young as you, you know? But uh, to be honest, and I mentioned this before, in Cuba everybody knows about two things, baseball and U.S. Cuba politics. You know, everybody, everybody has an opinion. Everybody say, okay. And, and people comes to me and say, uh, what is the feeling in Cuba? The, all the generations. And I say, well, the majority. And, and December the 17th, when we reestablish, uh, or we announce to the world that we are ready to work together, you can feel hope in the people. You know, people was happy for the first time in more than 50 years that, okay, we are talking, we, we are working together, we can improve the relations. So uh, the idea is that the consensus in Cuba is yes, in all the generations. Of course, uh, we don't know what is going to happen, but again, we, we cannot be af afraid. And the, the young generation right now uh, has this, and, and all Cuba has probably 
if we put an end to the embargo, we are going to have new challenge. But we cannot be afraid of that, you know? And of course, what, what we say is everything, every change in Cuba needs to have the consensus of the majority of the people. And of course, for the new generation, it's also more difficult because they don't know the past, you know? They, 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 they are now there and they say, why not? We, why we cannot have normal relations? So they are very involved in the Cubans, you can see again, uh, I'm not an, an, I was born in 1979, so I don't know nothing about the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, or the invasion of Bay of Pig, only what I read. And the new generation is even more difficult for them, you know, to understand why if we have relation with Canada, we cannot have relation with the United States. Or why if we have relation with Spain that occupied Cuba for centuries and kill a lot of, <laughs> kill our national hero, and we have no normal relation with Spain, why not with the United States? Oh, because we have a diff difficult uh, history? Okay, that is the past. Let's work. Thank you so much for the, for the question. Hi, I have two questions. I was trying to decide which one to ask, but I'll just ask both, and you can Please. choose one or the other or, or both. Yes. Um, one is, um, we were just in Cuba, I and my spouse were in Cuba, Just we just got back three weeks ago, and one of the last things the Obama administration did, it did while we were there, we saw the notice on Venezuelan mm -hmm. TV in the, as we were in the hotel, um, was end the wet foot, dry foot yes. policy, so that no longer can Cubans who come to the United States and make it to dry land mm -hmm. uh, automatically be guaranteed um, a year um, of legal status and then application for a green card after that. Mm. Or is it citizen, green card? Or is it citizenship? Anyway, they get to stay indefinitely. I believe citizenship is after two years. After two years, all right, mm -hmm. so it's both. Um, so my first question is what impact do you think that will have inside Cuba? Because some, like some of the commentary we saw had conservatives, mm -hmm. um, sort of anti-Castro conservatives saying they actually think it will be a good thing because it will, um, it will sort of force young people who have been trying, s many of whom have been trying to come to the United States to actually work from within to change the regime in ways they, they want it to change. So first question is sort of what do you think the impact okay. will be inside? You want the second one now or do you want to answer that no, one first? Ahead. All right, the second one is we were so struck when we were there by the um, presence of the private sector economy everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the bed and breakfasts that you know you can mm -hmm. arrange through Airbnb now, so it's very easy to stay someplace in a in a private home. Uh, the restaurants, every place, um, taxis, etc. The real, you know, it's it's, it's was good. It was great. It's, okay. it's gr a great time to be a tourist <laughs> in Cuba. But here's the question: It's changing Cuba inside yeah. in ways that I'm just guessing are worrisome to the to the Cuban government and to people in Cuba because so many people are leaving government occupations, which is a huge sector of the economy, of course, in a socialist country, and they can make a lot more money just mm -hmm. waiting table, for example, mm -hmm. in a restaurant or you know, working in the private sector. So teachers are leaving and architects are leaving and engineers are leaving and lawyers are leaving and mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of people are moving into the private sector. And so is there a concern that that's gonna undermine the Cuban economy in very radical ways and exacerbate um, inequalities and do, do things like that, that that would be of concern to you? Two very good questions. I don't know how much time I need to <laughs> for answer that, but, but, but about the first, about the wet food and dry food, that was something that Cuba for many years asked to the United States because since to that, we lost a lot of Cubans coming to the United States. And this is very simple. The majority of the Cubans that comes to the United States are not political refugees anymore. The majority comes as immigrants, economic immigrants, for the American dream uh, that was not created for Cuba, by the way. Uh, and we have Cubans, the, the, the immigration between Cuba and the United States don't start in 1959. Our cigars factories in Tampa come from the 19th century. Our national hero was here in the 19th century organizing the independence war of Cuba. So we have a relation with this country be before 1959. But after 1959, in 1964, the Congress passed a law, that is the Cuban Adjustment Act, that say if you're here, you're able to adjust your immigration status and you can become a resident and, and a citizen. And the problem is that everybody used that law in order to become a US resident or a US citizen. And I always say to people, you're not going to see any Cuban asking for an immigration reform here in the United States because they don't need it. You see Colombian people from 
uh, all Salvador, from everywhere, but not from Cuba. And the basis of that was not real, because we're not talking about political refugees. What, how are you a political refugee and you go back to your country after two years to spend money to see the family to go to the resource? So, and the only thing that this helped was the wet food, dry food in 1996, was to create a, a real a territory for the human traffic. Traffic. You know why? Because those people go to the embassy and they don't receive a visa, but they took a boat and go to Mexico and they come to the border and they were welcome. And I say, and you can read it, and I have one article that I can send to you uh, that is from Forbes maga Ford magazine that say the U.S. needs to end the U.S. Uh, the blank check to Cuba on immigration, and that create many create again many problems between both countries, and that create an opportunity for the human traffic. And we are talking about the people that pay ten thousand of dollars to come to the United States. You know, you you really believe that people that can pay ten thousand dollars to come to the United States cannot pay for a, for a ticket to come by plane? Ah, oh, but they don't have the visa, so they have to use the, the legal way to come here. So for many years we say if we, need, if we want to normalize the relation with the United States, we need to address the immigration problem. And Cuba changed their, our immigration, we changed our immigration policy, and we say in 2013, I believe, or 14, we say all people that wants to travel abroad, the only thing that they need is a visa and a passport. And people say, okay, the island is going to be empty. That doesn't happen. So people go, come, visit, and go back to Cuba. And by the way, in the last two years, I can say to you that we have the numbers of at least 13 Southern Cubans that return from the United States to live in Cuba. 13 Southern. And they collect <laughs> the money here and go to to, to Cuba. And you can read that many people from the, in Congress were asking to do a change to the Cuban Adjustment Act. So it's not only something, and I really, we really believe that it's going to help more, that it's going to create a real problem. And it's not fair to have, to have only that for the Cubans, you know, about the second question. What you say is true, and I mentioned before that 10% of our labor force is in the private sector. But as you say, we're talking about the people that have a high level of education. So we are facing a real challenge in our economic situation, but we have the capacity. If we improve the economy, and we really believe that we can improve the economy, remember the, the number I mentioned, we buy $2 billion of dollars every year in food, and the embargo costs $4.6 billion. So if without the embargo, we have four extra <laughs> billions to spend in food and in other things. And for the people that visit Cuba in the 80s and compare the situation now, they can see what I'm talking about. So we are not worried about this uh, because that is something that is, the, is because the situation that we have. The idea is very clear. We are not going to privatize education. We are not going to privatize health care. So those are priorities that needs to be uh, in the public sector in order to create, to, to have a society with equal opportunities for everybody. And the pre people that is in the private sector are the only people that have to pay taxes. And those taxes help to not create more difference among the people. And we really believe that without embargo, we can improve the economic life of the Cuban people. And if you are a lawyer and your wage uh, uh, and the situation improves and you're going to have a good wage, you're not going to be a taxi driver anymore. Or you're not, ah, but the problem is that you are a lawyer. So it's not that you are only a person that don't have any university degree and the only thing that you can do is to work as a waitress or work uh, 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 in the private sector. No, you are, again, an architect. You are, again, and if the situation improves and we can have better wages, and by the way, that is another thing I didn't mention. People say, how can you live with $20 per month? Your $20 are not our $20. That is the first thing that we need to say. And those $20 uh, even is for people that wants to have something more than food. And you, you visit Cuba. How many children in the street you saw? How no, many? None. So every time they say in Cuba, no, you, are, you have a poverty in Cuba, I say, no, no, no. We, ha we are humble. 
We, we don't have the resources that you have, but you don't see the poverty that you see in other places. So we can improve the life of the Cuban without embargo. And in that case, I remember I was born in 1979. In 1979, in the 80s, the most expensive hotel in Cuba cost 20 pesos per night. And the person who, cleans the, who cleaned the floor in my school earned 100 pesos. So even the people, the person who cleaned the floor in my school was able to save and spend one night in the more expensive hotel in Cuba in the 80s. Of course, that was also sense to the help that we received from the Soviet Union. We cannot, we cannot say that because, well, okay, we have an economy. Yes, but we improved many things during those years, and we create opportunities for the people who go to the university. My father was a farmer, mm. and now I am a diplomat. You can see? And that is another question that people ask to me. Why you have to buy 70 to 80% of all your, of, all your food if you have so many land? Well, because after you go to this university and you become a doctor, a lawyer, uh, an architect, you don't go back to the work to the farm. And that is another problem that we have right now. So thank you so much for both questions. Thank you. Um, stupid question, but we, we live in absurd times here. The Muslim ban, the mm -hmm. primary uh, consideration apparently for whether the Muslim ban was applied was whether there was a Trump hotel in the country that was affected. Has the Trumputin uh, Corporation approached uh, Cuba at all about building hotels? Because frankly, that might save you. Well, uh, to, to be honest, uh, and again, it's difficult for me because, again, I'm a, I'm a diplomat, you know, I am working for, to improve the relations. Uh, so, no, but in order, uh, to be honest, I don't have any information about that. I work in the political office, so, so my primary goal is to go to the Hill to try to convince people to, to support this bill, bills that can improve the relation. I don't work in the commercial office. I know that so many, many companies have has come to, to our embassy in order to, to know how to do business with Cuba. Uh, they have the problem with embargo. Uh, because they need license from the Department of the Treasury, Department of State, Department of Commerce. So it's a very complicated issue. Some companies are, are waiting to see the end of the embargo, and some companies are traveling now to see what they can do. Uh, we had the first product that comes legally from Cuba uh, as the first exports between, between Cuba and the United States and was charcoal. Uh, 50 tons of charcoal. It's very symbolic, but it's the first. We, the, people ask, why charcoal? Well, because it was the only product that we received the license to, to bring to the United States. We want to bring more. And about the hotels, as I mentioned, we have three hotels right now running by Starwood in, in Cuba. And so far, it's, it's OK. We have 60,000 uh, rooms in the in the hotels in Cuba right now. They are not enough because we receive four million of mm -hmm. tourists every year in Cuba. One million come from Canada, by the way. Uh, so we need more rooms. I don't know who is going now to, to try to build that, but it, again, it's good for both. You know, we, we can have more constructions, we can uh, more people working. And again, the idea is, because I know that people is worried, are you going to open McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chickens in Cuba? No, 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 that is not the idea. That is not the idea. So far, that, uh, that's, uh, that, that idea don't have the, the support of the majority of the Cuban. We are going to open the door for those business that can bring foreign investment, can bring technology, can bring something that is good, you know, uh, in this case, but al always to protect our own uh, economy. Thank you so, so much. Yes, I believe that. Uh, thank you very, uh, is this microphone on? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. I have two questions. One is for the audience. Mm -hmm. We are a very progressive city. We don't have a sister city anywhere in the world. Would anybody be interested in establishing a sister city with a city in Cuba? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, we have a majority. A question, a question to you. Yes. What can we do for you to help establish a sister city in Cuba? Well, uh, we, we need to, to, to work together and probably a proposal, uh, official proposal. We, we, we can 
again, uh, we can find ways to do things. We prove, as I mentioned before, you, you don't need, uh, you don't only need the federal government. You know, we have a wonderful relation with the state, with cities, with, uh, with solidarity groups. We, they, we did one uh, event in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you heard about that. It was boxing on the bridge. That is the Roberto Clemente Bridge. It's near, it's near the Pirate Stadium. Right. And they came to Cuba to invite the Cuban boxing team to come to the United States. And the people say, you are crazy. No, the Cubans are going to the Olympics. They are not coming here. And that person visit Cuba, and he buy the boxer. And our minister of sports said, OK, I, I cannot send the best, because the best are going to Rio. And he said, better, better. Probably we have, we have more opportunities in the, in the match. And they put a ring, and they put a ring in the middle of the Roberto Clemente Bridge. You see how symbolic is that to put a ring in the middle of the bridge? Wow. And it's on internet. You can see the, the files and everything. And we broadcast that to, um, to Cuba. Millions of Cubans saw the, the files, and everybody was happy. And the city council declare, declared that day as the friendship day between Cuba and the United States. So very symbolic, you know. And again, we didn't need the, the governor, or we didn't need the president. We, that was one idea that started in one city. I am very happy to be here today with all of you talking about this, because if what we need to, to see what we can do. And I remember when my friend came to the embassy and say, can I bring the leak to Cuba? And say, let's see what happened. And what's difficult, we, we, we have to, to see many things. But at the end, they visit Cuba. They, they, they travel to not only to Havana, they play with another team uh, outside, outside Havana. So we can do many, many more things together. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm. Uh, I was born in uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, and uh, Baton Rouge uh, uh, during Spanish colonial times, from Baton Rouge to Pensacola, was known as the East or the the West Florida parishes. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, it was a relationship that ended in uh, 1819 after Andrew Jackson's uh, unauthorized uh, Seminole Wars. Um, so um, a lot of our uh, colonial archives are actually <laughs> in, in Cuba, so yeah. we have a natural historical relationship. Mm -hmm. My mother grew up in, in New Orleans, and uh, uh, when, when she was growing up in the 1950s, she remembers a lot of her classmates in, uh, in the old Catholic school system would, would go to Cuba, daily ferries that would go from mm -hmm. New Orleans to Mobile to to, to Tampa, and you know, overnight you can go from uh, New Orleans to Havana. So it's 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 very exciting that what's past is prologue, and and we can uh, rebuild those relationships. Um, there's a retired uh, Major General Honore. Uh, he was a uh, Army general uh, whose roots were in. Uh, are in uh, Louisiana. I think he retired to Louisiana, but he's he's working a lot with uh, the Cuban government right now on uh, uh, public health preparedness. Uh, General Honore was uh, thrust into the spotlight during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, he was the commanding general in charge of the uh, the, the delayed uh, uh, defense support of uh, civil authorities, but um, but he's uh, working a lot with the national. Um, uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, Hurricane Watch and Preparedness um, uh, with, with, with Cuba. And uh, uh, lastly, I went to medical school in New York City, and there are a lot of uh, poor uh, 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 people from poor families who uh, took the opportunity to study medicine in, in, in Cuba, which was a shock to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I got a government scholarship to go to medical school in New York City, but uh, um, uh, you know, maybe there are a lot of, as you, you mentioned, uh, in healthcare and environmental stewardship and historical and cultural exchanges. There are so many natural relationships that, uh, that, that, that you mentioned. Uh, you know, finally, um, uh, you were rattling off uh, different properties that we took after the Spanish American War. I, I lived in Guam for a couple of years, so, you know, that. Uh, uh, when I lived in Guam, you know, I got to learn about all these uh, properties uh, that uh, used to be sovereign, but uh, at different stages were, were handled by uh, Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. Um, so um, we got a lot to work out. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I really believe, I really believe that we need to, to, to leave the past behind, you know. But the idea is hate is not the answer. 
You know, we need to work together. E even when we recognize that we have difference in many things, but again, if we work together, we can improve many things. And, and again, the only thing that we need is goodwill and respect. Thank you. Yes. Yo, thank you for an excellent presentation, but thank you also for all the hard work you did. <laughs> Took 75 people to uh, Cuba in uh, August. We had a fantastic time. We were beautifully received. Uh, we even won one of the three baseball games. <laughs> so I want to make sure that you have this uh, Cal Ripken Collegiate Baseball wow. League hat with the uh, R on the front and Thank the so U.S. and Cuban flags. I really appreciate it. I really believe uh, this was a wonderful example of things that we can do, that we can do together, you know, and, and, and about baseball is something that we, we love. Uh, and I know that people in Cuba was very happy to see the league. And I'm sure that they want the league back in, in, in Cuba. We can work uh, about this. Oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't know that, by the way. Uh, OK, well, the, the idea is, is, is that. And when people mentioned before what, what you can do, I, I can say two things. We, we need Congress. We need Congress. And I was very happy to see the new congressman here because we need the support for the bills that can improve the, 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 the relations between both countries. And, more, and now more than ever, because sometimes when you mention the polls, people say, yes, but those are polls. And I say, yes, but I go to many cities, I visit many places, and I see real people. So for that reason, again, I say resolutions by cities, by states, but are going to prove that this is what the majority wants. You know, So uh, it's something that everybody or people traveling to Cuba to, to come here and say, okay, the real Cuba is not what you read in the media. It's not, I remember one person that say, I, I, I arrived to Cuba and I was expecting to see a military in every corner and people dressed in, in red, in red or, or green and say, no, 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 that is not Cuba. <laughs> You're going to see people with uh, teachers and uh, baseball cap and people talking about everything. And if you go and say, I'm from Maryland, and people are going to say, oh, what about the Orioles? <laughs> what, what is it? So, you see, you see? Thank you so much. Yes, please. It's so great to have you here. It makes Tacoma Park <laughs> proud. We Thank look you. good today. Thanks. Thank you so much. I uh, lived for 32 years up the street on Maple and Tulip. And I worked on the Hill for many years. And then I got a master's in teaching English for speakers of other languages and taught at the Old Blair and the New Blair. And one of my students came from Haiti. And he was a great student, and he w was a very good athlete, and uh, his, he was particularly good in science because it was less language-based or more interestingly worked with the language he had. And uh, so he was on the varsity soccer team at Blair, said he wanted to go to college. He went to Columbia Union College, which is a Seventh-day Adventist college up the street. And he again excelled at the, on the soccer field and uh, did well in school, particularly in science. Told his advisor he wanted to be a doctor. Well, this young man from Haiti lives across the street. His mother and father still live across the street, directly front door to front door to the, I believe it's the Edinburgh building, on the third floor. I went over to see if anyone was home yet from church. Uh, so he, uh, he got a full scholarship to, Haiti, to uh, Cuba. And I took him out to lunch at uh, one of our favorite lunch places in Silver Spring, an Ethiopian little restaurant. And uh, as we walked out, I saw he had on new blue jeans. And there were these big lions and <laughs> faces on the back pockets. And I said, those are pretty cool. He said, these are my new school pants. He said, my mother hates them. <laughs> So he had his new blue jeans, and he was well on his way. He went to Cuba, and he was living in the dormitory waiting for school to start. And the advisor called him in and said, Mr. Destine, you may not study here. And Junior looked at him, and he said, uh, you don't know Spanish. And it was true. Nobody, nobody at the college, not his parents, not his friends, nobody had said, what about the language? <laughs> So his advisor said, come back in a year, go to language school, we'll reinstate you next year. And Junior had no money in his pocket. He just had the scholarship for the school 
but no money to live on his own for a year and go to language school. And he said, no, sir, I must begin medicine right away. And he did. He t took himself out of the dormitory. It wasn't, it, the kids hadn't all arrived yet and it, it felt very desperate. He didn't have any buddies and it was a language thing. But he had the money. I guess he was able to get the money from the dorm and he offered it every month and he lived in family homes all over Havana. And they loved it. It was a little income for them. And, and to make a long story short, he did well. He graduated three or four years ago and I was able to go to Cuba for his graduation. And I went illegally. <laughs> 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 and uh, when, I, when I came back, I felt so empowered by the, uh, by the honesty and the integrity and the courage of the people in Cuba that all the papers I signed, why did you, where did you come from? And I wrote Cuba. What was your purpose there? I just laid it out. I, I didn't make it look like I was stopping in Mexico when I transferred planes. That was, that was just a great honor. And, and so we have a young student from Haiti who was very blessed to be in Cuba. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you for sharing this story. <laughs> My other little, little story yeah. is it's so unusual, but I was a friend of Ronnie Moffat. Mm. And I, thank you for honoring her today because no one has brought her name up for all these years. She and I were on the planning committee for the Creative Living Fair on the Mall the year before the Bicentennial, the great festival that we all celebrated. And so this. Creative Living Fair was in 1975. It was alternatives in, in uh, all manners of living for e ecological purposes and economic purposes. And Ronnie was a friend. She came to my house for meetings here on Maple Avenue. And uh, the shock of 1976 with uh, Letelier, it, it was just incredible. And I had the honor of marching with her family to church. But you, you sort of have brought this community, you know, tapped into what this village is too. So thank you for being here and to come back all the time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Great. Well, um, it's after six o'clock. <laughs> we did not think we were going to go that long, but this is wonderful. We were uh, I, wonderful to get together, to hear the stories, um, and to share them. Then that was what today was about, to begin this relationship, to continue a conversation. And I want to thank everybody um, who is able to um, attend today. And I see a good friend, Lindolfo, from Casa de Maryland. Thank you so much for coming today, um, and for all of you. And I'm sure we will continue the conversation. So thank you so much to Mr. Faga and to our county council member. <laughs> and of course, to Rienberto. Thank you. Have a nice evening.